Welcome to the Books to Business podcast, Eddie Pinero. I'm Terrence McMahon, and this week we have Brene Brown's Dare to Lead. Some nice COVID reading here. COVID reading, brave work, <laughs> tough conversation, and whole hearts. Yeah. We got the, uh, the green light from the mayor of Miami today. Looks like we're going to go back to yeah. semi-life as normal. That uh, came up quick, too. I was thinking... Like May 1st. He said Wednesday. They're opening parks at uh, social distancing. So congratulations to everybody that made it through the unthinkable. Um, and we're going to ease our way back in. That's what it's all about. But yep. we stayed busy. We've all been, everyone watching this, we've been reading, making the most, you know? I, I got to tell you, I don't think I've ever been so productive in my whole life. <laughs> I absolutely <laughs> haven't. <laughs> like I'm shot out of a cannon. It's, uh, it's I good. started writing a book. I'm almost done with it. Um, and like... It's it's really cool. Uh, this 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 book. Uh, everybody probably saw her TED talk, where she talked about vulnerability. And this is a uh, a great book if you're a leader. I mean, anyway, you know, leadership comes in a lot of flavors. You know, you can lead at home, but uh, if you're if you're even a, a solopreneur or, or running a business, we talked last week about why and Simon Sinek's book. Start with why about how to inspire people to follow you. Um, the concept of vulnerability and leadership is an interesting, uh, definitely art, not science. Yeah, an essential piece. And to your point, she talks about leading yourself and leading others, leading yourself before you can lead others. Yeah. Um, and vulnerability, because her first book was about vulnerability, wasn't it? Yeah, her, her, her product is basically vulnerability. I love how she connected the dots back to business. Right, because she, I, she, you know, she left corporate, kind of the corporate world, and did research on this vulnerability, and did her famous, now famous TED talk on vulnerability and shame, and now she's, you know, she left uh, uh, the corporate because of that, in my mind, from what I hear, and then she's connected the dots back to having leadership and business training about how corporations can be more, more vulnerable, have a higher degree of um, of empathy, which, right. which she talks about as the antidote to shame. Um, but you know, it's interesting uh, it op- the book opens up about, you know, how leaders can be more vulnerable and don't make the mistake of being too vulnerable. You know, if you get, get up in front of your shareholders and say, you know, I'm here today, I'm nervous. I don't know what I'm doing. I have no idea how to make money. Right. Please help me is not the, the way to get vulnerable out of the gate. So we're going to kind of share some ideas on how she positions vulnerability you know, in leadership and in life, um, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah, that was one of the first things she did was kind of define what what, uh, vulnerability is not. And it's not, you know, positioning yourself to, uh, you know, garner sympathy. It's not like it's, it's it's a tool that will help you see things as they really are and improve. You're not hedging your bets. You know, it's it's a different type of... of Do you see this as more of a... I mean, at the risk of getting uh, ridiculed, uh, I'm not currently working for anyone, so I can't be fired. <laughs> but the, you know, because she talks about visit, visiting on inclusion as in vulnerability, you know, difficult conversations that leaders don't have about inclusion, race, ethnicity, you know, the dirty little secrets that, that no one wants to talk about out front and everyone just toes the company line. Mm-hmm. But a lot of these, these, these attributes of vulnerability, I, I feel, are very feminine. Um, you know, and I'm trying to acquire those skills, you know, to be more empathetic and compassionate. Right. I mean, that was, there were a few times throughout that book where I was reading it and, and it felt that way. Right. Um, you know, there were things where she, like I was joking around with Steve, like I can never imagine, you know, as we're having one of our masterminds look at you and say, Terry, I hear you and I feel you. Like, there, right. you know what I mean? There are just certain <laughs> things where I'm like, uh, but I mean, I get the point. Right. But, um, yeah, I agree. I mean, I would have to agree. 100%. But everybody has, you know, masculine and feminine energy. It just depends on how it's delivered and packaged. And some people never let it out. I mean, right. I clearly have empathy and compassion. And sometimes you don't have the, the right words or the right framing to, to visit on that and have that, that conversation. Uh, one, of, one of the things I enjoy about what she says is like the, you know, from one of our earlier books, which I don't think is right here, is The Obstacles the Way by Ryan Holiday. Mm-hmm. Like the, the vulnerability of, of having that difficult conversation instead of uh, bypassing it, you know, and taking, uh, she talks about courage over comfort. Right. It's like the courageous thing is to, is to brutal, brutally confront the facts to another great book, Jim Collins. Like it is the brutal reality that this isn't working 
and this is why let's deal with it right now, which is a very, you know, as I had some very strong feminine leaders in my organization, I had some of the strongest ones, and they were always quite comfortable to go right there. Right. And I'd be like, whoa, here we go. You right, know? right, right. And uh, it's, it's kind of cool to see, that, to, to that see a framework to do that. Doesn't that come down to biology, sort of the <clears throat> interpersonal? Like you mentioned on the porch, I mean, the <clears throat> statistically females, uh, what, what arena were we talking about here? Where they were managers, s- leaders. They tend more, to perform better across the board. They're, they're, they're better um, statistically in the industries I was in. They're, they're always way more prepared. They follow up. They, they're better at st- tracking data. Um, and then they're uh, less, um, what is it called? It, uh, intrinsic. Is that the word? You know, you got algorithmic and then you have the... Oh, the opposite of algorithms. It was, it was more of like, like a lot of... A like, lot a, of like emotional IQ? Is that what we're talking about? I don't know. I think I got it wrong. Oh, well, it's all right. Algorithmic is like, they're more methodical, I think, with data. Uh-huh. You know, if you tell them to do something in general, and this, this, could, this may not be correctly put, but I, in my experience was they, they play more in the, in, the, in the sandbox better. Mm-hmm. And sometimes some of my Maverick salespeople, sales managers especially, would never follow the system and they'd get their result their way and, and the other ways. But we'd have way more conflict in the, in the uh, Maverick system. Mm. Way more conflict. Interesting. So I'm wondering if they didn't have the ability to resolve the conflict because of lack of empathy or lack of compassion or they just weren't buttoned up enough. I can look back. It's like every yeah. single time it's someone who drifts and wanders from our core values and our core competency, we have problems. Right. So. It's interesting stuff, man. It, I mean, she talks <coughs> about it in terms of, of armor and yeah. being in an arena. And people have, because I think, you know, race aside, sex aside, mm-hmm. gender aside, if you can't be vulnerable, you're at a tremendous disadvantage, period. You know, and so those intricacies, she ties to vulnerability, but it's mm-hmm. a basic human element that is not comfortable. And we obviously, it's no one wants to be vulnerable, right? right. It's something that we naturally try and repress. But leaders, leaders have a hard time being truly tra- tra- vulnerability. I think is very, very close to transparency. And there's things that people want to talk about, or at least open dialogue up. And with so much criticism, you see it a lot with press briefings and. And one doctor comes out with a, an opinion about a way to solve a very big problem. All of a sudden, they're being ridiculed, and because they put themselves out there to you know to kind of share an idea, a possibility. And I think our culture kind of shuts that down if you if you if you go outside the dots. Yeah, I yeah. see that a lot. She refers to it as armor in the, yeah. in the arena. It's called armor armor lead armor leader versus the daring leader. Right. Yeah. And the daring leader not only breaks that armor down or doesn't rely on it as a crutch, but encourages, you know, he or she encourages their people to do the same and cultures where there's, and it's, I guess you were talking about her circling back to the corporate world. I mean, her motivation was seeing so many businesses, so many companies run where that's just not present where people are ashamed and scared to be vulnerable because the repercussions are so that yeah you, you can't you can't say what you want to say yeah and you you, you guard it and, and therefore because any then you end up with with uh, two versions of how who you are you have the version of who you're pretending to be right. because you can't be transparent and vulnerable right that's that's the person that you you think you, you're going to tell them what they want to hear and then you have the person you really are you know you don't believe it that's when all the back the back uh the back door meetings and the second the underhanding uh passive aggression it comes into play also uh she called something what i love was the dirty yes mm. the dirty yes is you have a conversation you look somebody in the eyes and they say yes i agree with you and the reality is they don't no chance right? the reality <laughs> yeah. is it's, it, they're escaping the vulnerability of having a tough conversation yeah and then Just you gonna, go, yeah, sure i'll do that they're gonna they're gonna undermine your situation and that's a big problem in my right. mind it's a big problem yeah we had a values exercise. What it, what it was kind of cool was the the barometer of opportunities versus your core values. Like good leaders, uh, daring leaders stick to their core values. And there was an exercise I love. We all did it. Right, yeah, Steve, that's right. There was a hundred core values that were that that, that were on one of the pages, and she said she she had to go through and pick like eight or ten, and then whittle it down to two. Yeah, it was a fun. It's, it's 
coming off of start with why it's interesting, right? Yeah. Because there's a, a parallel there between your why, your reason for doing everything, and then your core values, they sort of run in tandem. Right. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it helps you like the same way. It's a filter. Everything in your life, you run against those values. And if they work, you, you go forward. And if they don't, you don't. Yeah. You know? And you test everything against those core values. Even at, you know, one of the, one of the uh, hers, are, hers are courage and faith. Like she's a she's a person of faith, but she's also a person of courage. Uh, and one of the under under courage is one of her values was the equality. So she's had a, had a, a story about how someone was saying something mm-hmm. in a small group, and everyone was like an off color joke, and everybody was laughing. And and she had she she didn't want to, but she, in her value system, she has the courage to speak up. She stops and says, "Whoa, like that's that's not okay, not in my presence at least. Right. Uh, please never say that again around me." So that's the that's the barometer to 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 guide your decisions. What were your uh, your values? Your two? Um, my values were creativity and legacy. Creativity and legacy. Yeah, and I think that's as as I was unpacking them. You know, there were a few that seemed similar. You know, ambition. Um, you know, for me, like just for to, I was saying to Steve, to feel fulfilled, I need to feel like I'm making progress. It's just this sense of purpose and like contentment that I can't even really explain, but I live for it. And it's that alone has cut off a lot of important things in my life that I thought were important. It's I've sacrificed a lot for that, <clears throat> but it always ends up being the center of my universe. Right. And so I think that's legacy. And the way I want to do that is by being creative, mm-hmm. um, you know, trying to carve out my own path, my own lane. So, there were a hundred, a hundred different things to choose from. Like I, I went through the exercise too. Mm-hmm. Like I'll read a few of them off: accountability, achievement, adventure, balance, beauty, belonging, career, collaboration, commitment, compassion, confidence, joy, job security, integrity, hope, honesty, family, self-respect, self-expression, self-discipline. Wisdom, openness, optimism, freedom, fulfillment. Like yeah. there's so many, and so we, me and Steve, did, you were in your room uh, creating a video. So I could hear you through the through, <laughs> through, off the porch, but Steve and I did it today. What were your two core values? I got uh, freedom and fulfillment. It was uh, tough because, well, like you did, like the way you did, it was really good. You come up with ten, and then you kind of see, compare them each one to see, what, and they fall under it. So I had there was a bunch of others that I really had under there, like authenticity. It was a big one for me, like being yourself, but that falls under freedom. And then there's a bunch, but they all fall under each other. What was it? Freedom and what? Uh, fulfillment. Fulfillment. I think of fulfillment more as like uh, doing, like living that. That's like the purpose for everybody's life is hopefully they live a life that's fully fulfilled and also like that they enjoy. That's like freedom and fulfillment. That's what kind of. I have your list here. You had adaptability, authenticity, effectiveness, faith, Bad family, writing. <laughs> fr- gratitude, humor, love, make a difference, patience, peace. Like there's a yeah. lot of great yeah, values was, here. Yeah. And, and then, you know, she, she recommends going down to two. Mine were uh, uh, wisdom, gaining knowledge and uh and then I'm sharing it through uh through uh, making a difference contribution there you go Did you, you made a list like that i compare yeah i made a list and, and and you know family came in there and um freedom was important to me time's really important to me you know me i'm i'm like crazy about time but i compared all of them against you know, against being able to have that one core value, because if I if I have wisdom, meaning share the wisdom in my mistakes that I've made in life with others, so they avoid them, and wisdom about how to get over bad times uh, vis-a-vis algorithms and systems and knowledge that I've acquired, and I share it like we do here in the podcast, and I gain it by reading books and 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 learning. Um, everything else will fall into place. Hmm. It'll roll up to there. What right? I liked about these words was. Um reading all those values are so many. It's really hard to whittle it down. But I remember she said in the book, uh, emotional literacy. And the way she put it was like, if you went to the doctor and you had all these ailments, but you were all duct taped up and you couldn't even explain what hurt you. It was like the doctor knows you're in pain, but they can't help you, has no idea what to do. And that was a great way of putting uh, emotional literacy is like, you can't express your feelings. You can't, uh, you can't heal them. You can't make, you can't improve on them and you can't use it to be a, a leader. I like the way she put that. 
If you're a leader, though, and your core values are, like my core values are learning or, you know, having wisdom and, and a contribution, like those are two things that are really important to me. Everything that comes along, we get lots of now opportunity. A lot of people say, oh, help me do this. You get a lot of calls on, you know, people that want your help or they want you to go on this show. And, and you got you to gotta put, you got to kind of filter that against your values. Otherwise, you'll be bouncing all over the place like a clown. Right. Yeah, that's why I was saying, like, exactly like Simon Sinek, it helps you cut and, and really stay focused. Um, what did you say about clarity? Clarity is... Kind? Uh, kind. Yeah. Yeah, clear, clear, yeah, clear is kind and unclear is unkind. Right, and I think that applies to, you know, number one, too. It applies to you just like it applies to everyone else, like, your, yeah. you know, your, your relationship with everyone else. Right. Um, there are... Go ahead. If you're at the end of your life and you lived a life that gave you those two values, you lived those two values and you look back, would you change it for any other? Well, hopefully not. Right. That's, yeah, that's, that's a good it. test though. If yeah. You, you know, I know how important creativity is to you. You know, and then, then well, you're, 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 pushing creativity against another one. I was, I was thinking, what was the other one? You're well, my question was, um, there the were a legacy. few that were legacy, like ambition and legacy. Right, right, right. And ambition's the gateway to legacy. Yeah, yeah they so, kind of fall under each other. I had the same problem, but I feel like if you had to choose between two of those, which one's kind of more encompassing, I would say. I mean, for you, you'd have to make the decision, but legacy kind of encompasses ambition. Yeah. Legacy's a result, yeah. I think. Ambition's a... It's kind of a, a driver. Dream. A well, dream. that, yeah, that made me think about the actual meaning of value then. Because yeah. it's like, what is that, is that essentially asking, do you value the process or do you value the result? Man, that's a deep, that's a well, deep point. Yeah. I'm like, well, <laughs> that's what a that? deep conversation. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a great point. I don't know. I was, I like that as well because I had a lot of those that I w- didn't want to cut out. But I think if, if it's under the umbrella, I don't know if it matters. It just helps. I think they narrow it down to two so you can always have a sort of like a, lanes to stay in. I don't know. That's kind of, they're they're all under there. It's not like one, you use one and not the other, but it's a tough one. I think in the context that it's presented here, it's, it's a, it's a filtering system to put your, you know, so you don't go drift too far from your values. You start doing things that are either against your values or aren't necessarily in your wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. I guess a good question would be, sorry to cut you off. It would be, uh, if you had ambition for something, but that doesn't help get you towards your legacy. Right, or you had an easy way out of your life and it didn't involve creativity. If someone offered you a bunch of money to do something for you. You actually have a real life example of that. I, don't, I doubt you're going to share. What? Well, you, there's, you, there's things you do you don't want to do. Oh, yeah. That isn't going to be part of your, your core value. Some things we have to do. I mean, we just have to do them to, to, to yeah. advance the business. Well, well, I'm lucky in the sense that at least it's like doing these things improve the skills that I care about. It's just, I'd rather be doing them for me than for a client. (laughs) But but like, I like the things. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. It's just different saying, okay, what, what, how would they tell the story and then tell it through their eyes? Like I, I like telling it through my eyes. I'm a, right. Maybe, maybe I'm a selfish creator. I don't know, but I doubt that. (laughs) I doubt you're selfish. (laughs) I was, um, talking the other day and um she goes through mentions the book uh in the book it's called i think boots and shovel uh as a response to someone being vulnerable with you and it's the one thing when she was going over the list i'm like dude i do that so much when people are like say something that's really tough and like hard on themselves and i go like Oh no, you're not! Oh, like that. you're the best. <laughs> What's that? It's bullshit. Like, yeah, just like digging, like you know. Oh, that is funny. I'm like that because it is. It's a cop out. She's like, it doesn't yeah. help to, you know. Yeah, try that's and the, pat that's it. the courageous conversation versus the, the one to, get out of the conversation. Right. 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 Yeah. There's a there's a there's a um, he talked about the doctor doesn't know what's wrong with you, mm-hmm. and then. I would really connect it with a concept. I was on a coaching call today and I was talking about con- uh, the concept of chandeliering mm. and like it was a weird word. I never heard it before. And it's a medical term. Her doc- her husband's a, me- a doctor and chandeliering is when the doctor's trying to find out what's wrong with you and they're probing. And some people are kind of tough. Like I, if something hurts and I had, I went through this a lot when I was sick, like does that hurt? And you know, they'd be sticking a, a needle oh in my, my abdominal. God. I was like, no, it's no problem. No, we're cool, man. Right. And then once in a while they'd turn it and I'd be like, whoa. Right. And then like that 
that pain shoots you through the chandelier. Like you can't hide it. And there's something called emotional chandeliering is when you're, uh, when something hits you and, and it just makes you want to blow up you, and you have this emotional response and someone's like, what happened to you? And you start going off. And today I was coaching a, a group and I was explaining the concept of chandelier and the guy didn't understand it. And he says like, what? I said, well, I have, I have, uh, I'm very sensitive when I do training and people don't show up and they usually offer like legitimate excuses or a lot of times they didn't offer legitimate excuses. So I heard so many over the years. Mm-hmm. I was like the boy who cried wolf. <clears throat> I hear like, oh, this and that. <clears throat> and somebody was not at the, at the training. I was like, yeah. And the, the, the technique that she uses is called, this, you know, say the story that I'm telling myself to the person you're upset with. Right. Instead of just saying, hey, why were you at my training? You know, in your back of your mind, you're saying, you, 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 what do you think? My train is not worth it or you don't value yeah. what I'm saying. Right, right, right. So what, what the, you know, what the coaching, the coaching I would say is I'm wondering why you're not at my training because the story that I'm telling myself is that you think this training is not worthy of your time and I don't know what I'm talking about and this is going to be a big giant waste of time for you and you won't make any money going to it. Hmm. What's true for you? So you'll get a better answer than accusing them of missing your training because the person, by the way, that missed the training had uh, his parents had COVID nineteen, which which I was like, oh, that's a valid excuse. Right, right. I'm trying to like say, oh, I'm an, I'm an idiot, right? Oh, so I should man. have said, you know, the, the the story I'm going through in my mind is you're just blowing this off and you're making me look look bad, right? Instead of saying like, oh, you really have a problem. Yeah. They say no, that's not the story at all. The story is different goes back to sapiens we think in stories right you know everything we construct is like through different narratives so she in the book she tells a cool story about uh, you know she's having a terrible day and her husband opens the fridge and he goes oh there's not even any ham and she takes that to imply like you know Brene didn't go to the grocery right. store she <laughs> yeah. runs over starts you know getting <laughs> in his face and um he didn't mean that at all. He's like, you don't even go to the grocery store. I go to the grocery. What's wrong, honey? Like that type of thing. Right. But and that's an, an extreme example. But there's so many times where we like insert motives into other people and think things are happening because people are thinking certain things that they're not. Right. And we live out these narratives that just aren't real. It's so yeah. interesting. The chandelier. You, know, you hit. A, you hit a nerve, especially when you hit a nerve. Yeah. Um, and it's called the shitty first draft of a story. Mm. Like. Or Stormy, if you're talking to little kids. That was a tip. Oh, Stormy, yeah. Stormy first draft. Well, I don't doubt we have any kids, but if we do... Oh, no, I'm just saying. Out. Yeah. That's right. Stormy first... Stormy? Is that what she's Yeah, she said Stormy, stormy for, for kids, shitty for adults. Well, what the, it's, it's a, that's actually a writer's term. And when you're having trouble writing, the, you know, everyone wants to write a book and they always sit down and they get writer's block and they can't write. And Jack Canfield... Uh, taught me this technique. He said, just barf it onto the table as we call it vomit copy. Mm -hmm. You just blah, you just blah, because no one's going to see it. And in an interaction with a human being, you have this shitty first draft where you're, you're interpreting, interpreting everything for the bad towards your, your predispositions. And it might not be the reality at all. But if you have that first draft kind of, kind of laid out and you say, well, the story that I'm reading and seeing in my mind is this. And, you, and before you lash out, you have a conversation with someone about it. Right. It's like, is this right? <laughs> it's like I always say, uh, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> it's like the dude down there. Remember a couple months ago, the construction guy? Oh, God. <laughs> like, I doubt when you think about that, he was like, oh, you know, there's a, a citizen walking by. Let me go ruin his life. You know, he's just, I'm sure. Th- having Ed, a bad do day. you think you would act differently now after reading all these books and having all these, this knowledge that we talk about so frequently <laughs> with these interactions? I hope I would. I hope I would. <laughs> That'd be interesting. Well, tell the yeah. story. It's an interesting story. I mean, just. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I'll tell it. I forget most of the details. It was a quick one. Uh, but I just remember there was some, long story short, there's a little bridge on A1A, and there was someone that was like, you can't. Or he had a sign that said roads closed. I had my headphones in and there weren't cars going by, but there were still people walking around it. And so mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I'm going to walk around it. And he said, I don't know if you can read. And he pointed <laughs> to the sign. <laughs> he said, but the roads closed. And I just, yeah, I had a field day with him for a little bit. I guess you zinged him, yeah. <laughs> I zinged him. Uh, but yeah, like I, you know, that's a perfect example. She talks about this. Ryan Holiday talks about it a lot. Um, I heard Lewis Howes talk about it on one of his podcasts. Depersonalizing confrontation like that is never about you. 
Right. It's he's about he's overreacting person. and you overreacted. And that's when that's when uh, stuff hits the fan. That's when things escalate to another level. Right. That stuff can easily escalate. Yeah. That's a that's a form of chandelier. You know, you hit a nerve with him. Probably he probably told 10 people before and they all walked right past him like he was not even a human being. And then he Could said be. something mean to you and you made him not feel like a human being. Maybe. <laughs> I, I mean, I well, whatever. Far. I mean, yeah, they, that's a that's a whole a whole uh, whole interaction, right? And right. the first draft of it is, I mean, you don't really have time though to, to do a first draft of that one if you're alone. No, it's off the top, yeah. off the dome, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, um, we had a we chat about people that uh, you know try to run you off the road rage, like mm. saying, how do you make be objective oh, about it, tools. remove yourself from remove yourself from it, and look at it as an object. Like you're being objective, you remove yourself from the situation. Was that the pink bunny one? I forget which one it was. <laughs> no, I don't <laughs> think. It, I don't think it was the tools. I think it was something else. It just. It was uh, about. We, we said it in the tools episode. I it was. No, I mean it, it. It came up like. Um, I forget what it was too. I've read so many books. I know. Well, that's great. That means it's working. Yeah, when the concepts six. stick, but you forget where you're learning them. It only sticks because of the stories. Right. Right, yeah, and we still remember the guy with the science story. I'll never forget that story <laughs> because it is an exa- exact example of, well, he overreacted, you overreacted, but at least you caught, you both caught yourselves. You know, you didn't get into a situation. Right. What's funny about these stories, like the stories you tell yourself, is that you tell these stories and then they stick with you, and then you don't realize that they're directing your your subconscious, like throughout the whole day or just for for, for so long. You just con- the way you show up to work every single day is going to direct you. It's That's crazy. So true. Yo, you had a um, a really cool. Uh, I don't know if it's an idea, but you before bed you write down a bunch of positive things. So yeah. when you go to sleep, it fills your subconscious. Yeah, I <laughs> love that. So I learned. Have that. you? So I've learned that. Um, I think it was Joe Dispenza actually, but like when you sleep, your brain waves are more are closer to your subconscious waves, or your sub- when you sleep. Yeah, I forget what it is. But yeah, but you get closer to those waves. So if you try to journal before you sleep, that's why a lot of times when you watch TV right before sleep, they're in your dreams. Or you read something, those are what appear in your dreams. Isn't that awesome? So I intentionally write like a goal I have in the future. It's more like uh, future pacing. I learned it from life coaching, which was you have a, you write a journal entry as if it's however long in the future. The more tactical way is like you do a month, then you do three months, then you do six months. But I just like to have a little bit more fun with it, put like 10 years or something, which is part of it as well. And you just write 10 years today, I did this, and it feels like amazing. I, whatever, bought my mom a house. She'll be happy if she's listening to this. And so... Uh, and then it's like kind of fills you with some gratitude, which is the goal. And then you feel just like, it's just like a fun fantasy. And then it also gets in your subconscious. So you wake up with these like memories. Your, your brain doesn't really know the difference. So if you dream about it as well, it's just wins, wins for your brain. Yeah, you're formatting your brain at night. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. guy, that guy's, uh, he, we got to do one of Joe Dispenza's books pretty soon. Definitely. I hear, I hear nothing but great stuff about him. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't studied him but I've, I've heard his stuff. So your mother listens to this podcast? Yeah, sometimes. Does your mother listen to the podcast? She, she does. My mother listens to this <laughs> podcast. Our mothers should have like a Zoom meeting about it. They're, they're oh three sons. God. That'd be great. <laughs> That's just a side. You think bar. they're having a podcast together? Well, <laughs> no. Maybe they are. <laughs> My mother's been, uh, she's learned how to video conference people with Facebook Messenger. She's been terrorizing everybody all over America. <laughs> 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 Everyone's she, getting blown up. <laughs> she, I, she says, I'll never be able to do that. So one day I showed her, I, I, I was like, Mom, look at the, the little camera with the green dot. Like, that means somebody's on their. Their uh, their their Facebook account right now, and she goes really. I, I think she noticed. Oh, I mean, my mother's a smart lady. She's a, a registered nurse and manager, so she's been she learned an algorithm on how to how to communicate to people. That's so a little cool. off off key, but that's kind of cute. Yeah. Our mothers are good listeners. At least we're going to get three views in our uh, stories. But um, <laughs> talk about it. Oh, uh, oh, three's good. Anyway, <laughs> off the mamathon. Uh, shame and empathy. Yeah, she says shame is uh, is like an uh, epidemic, and empathy is the antidote to shame. That was really cool. I'd never never thought of it like that. The ability to connect with someone, um, to show empathy, completely mitigates shame. They cancel each other out. And, and then she also talks about the difference between um, empathy and sympathy, which for me. Uh, was important. I didn't really understand that. That's a distinction. That. So she used the metaphor of a well. She says someone's down, um, stuck in a well. Mm-hmm. Empathy is throwing a rope down, um, you know, going down and then saying, all right, I'm with you. Let's get out of here. Oh. Sympathy is 
staying on top and saying, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Grab the rope. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah. 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 You're good with metaphors, man. Uh, well, that's hers, but yeah. well, uh, you're also good at borrowing people's metaphors. <laughs> that's also good. But she, you know, I talked to guilt and shame. She, she, um, I always had a difficulty with guilt and shame, but guilt is the guilt is I've done something bad. That's an example. And shame is I am bad. Mm. Like you have this negative, negative view of yourself, almost like the shadow from the tools and, and, uh, and that's Carl Jung's work. Like the shadow, you always think of like, God, I hope, um, you know, I hope people don't expose me for what I am. I'm really, I'm supposed to be this leader and I'm supposed to know what to do. I have no idea what to do. I'm failing. I'm, I'm, I'm exposed. And what do I do? Do I hide or do I share? Right. And how much do I share of what I don't know? Because they'll lose faith in me. Right. That came up in, in the book when she was talking about, um, you know, your, she didn't refer to it as a shadow, obviously. It was just your least, she had a term for it. Your, the th- whatever it is that you don't want to be. And that's when you misread people and you misread, to your point, like stories and things like that the wrong way. You yeah. are interpreting, like you're using the narrative of what you don't want to be as that's the trigger point. Do you get what I'm saying? Right. So like yeah. you have what you don't want to be. Anytime something pushes you or like you're misreading a conversation or you get angry, you jump to a conclusion, those things you don't want to be are driving that. Oh, that's interesting. I like the uh, to Joseph Campbell quote the the cave you fear holds the treasure you seek holds the treasure you seek yeah uh, that's that luke skywalker uh she brought luke skywalker when he remember when yoda says into the cave you must go and he says no weapons you need and he goes in but he takes his lightsaber yeah and, and yeah. he cuts off vader's head and it's him and you know his head so what he feared was himself he feared himself yeah yeah that's deep Star Wars always seems to make it into every single podcast for some reason. Well, it's like the perfect <laughs> storyline. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of books, yeah. You know. Do you know Joseph Campbell consulted with Lucas in that in that movie? Really? Yeah, yeah. I've heard that a few different times. She actually mentions it in his book that you know Joseph Campbell does the hero's journey, and he wrote the Hero of a Thousand Faces. So he had the myth, the the, the chronological, historical data, and why the great stories survive, and what are the components that make up a great story. And we've talked about this of probably three or four times, mm-hmm. right? And we, you know, it's a, you know, it's this backstory and a hero with a problem and then there's, resolu- there's a, a resolution and, and uh, some other thing. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> At some point, are we going to tell everybody what to now, do? Now, do it now. Thing? Go ahead. Let him in. Just let him in on the secret. We can't hide it. Okay, here's the Go secret. Ahead. Regularly, for whatever reason, the universe has an amount of things that are right or wrong or good or bad, and there always seem to be three or four. So every time we say three or four, uh, we can't help it. If you were on the li- if they were on the live stream, they they would have known it already. But yeah, it's just <laughs> so an we inside have to joke. Underst- we got to give a little bit of backstory yeah, here. I mean, this is a big part of the books to business <laughs> podcast. Yeah. So this is like a month after Terry and I start working together. He makes this face and he goes, you know, three or four. And I was, I started cracking up. I'm like, what's that from? And it's, what's his name? Pete. His name Pete Puma. Pete Puma. The, from a Bugs Bunny. Yeah. It's the most amazing cartoon ever. But then it makes you realize, right, after he says three or four, how many times people say that in a given day. Everyone just walks around saying three or four nonstop and no one notices. So right. now that you've all been I made always aware. Say three or, every time you hear us say three or four, you're going to hear us laugh because it, yeah, that, that's three the, or four. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh I was on a Zoom call today, and I said three or four. And every time I do that, I see Steve <laughs> peeping over his little computer at me, and I've got seventeen people la- looking at me, and I'm <laughs> laughing. And, then, and I was talking about a serious matter. But, um, bad, she says it a bunch of times in this yeah. book. I was running down the street listening to an <laughs> audio book, and I almost can't, like people just can't avoid saying three or four. Yeah, she's written three or four books about this. So I'll be trying to play that tune every time uh, Every time these guys say it. So stay yeah, tuned. Yeah, bring a little levity to the situation. Uh, so, uh, anyway, we were talking about shame. Yeah. We're talking about shame. <laughs> uh, I had something interesting that I thought was just, just a quick nugget, which yeah. was um, when people gossip, it's like a, they, they think they're be connecting with the other person because they're sharing someone else's secret when they Mm -hmm. gossip but it's really like a temporary connection because when they leave that meeting now you're wondering well that person just shared a secret about him can i trust him 
about my secrets. Oh, that was the part about yeah. trust. Yeah. Do you know, do you know if you tell someone something's a secret, there's an eighty <laughs> percent higher chance they're going to tell someone else as opposed to not telling them it was a secret. That's Precious a, cargo. Yeah, it's a statistic. I think that's like very disturbing. Yeah. yeah. And the uh, the happiness hypothesis of all reason for all re- uh, of all reasons. Okay. Is that? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Of all, maybe yeah. three or four uh, yeah. Advil. Whatever. In the ha- yeah, I probably do. In that happiness hypothesis, John Height, t- for whatever reason, there it is. Um, in the happiness hypothesis, he talks about <laughs> um, that form of connectedness and how like gossip makes people feel closer together, and there's a, a reciprocity and like a prid pro. I can't. I'm I'm done talking yeah. for today. So that also came up in uh, Riveted. Riveted. Remember when Riveted he talked about like secrets are are compelling. Oh, oh that is in Riveted yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. So they're compelling. Like what makes people compelling is secrets. Right. Yeah. But, I mean, there's that's an interesting thing. Um, and talk about vulnerability. Like secrets come show up in the form of vulnerability. If you ever tell anyone a secret, it's like hey. I have a secret for you. I have no idea what I'm doing right now. <laughs> I'm leading this big company. I have absolutely no clue. Uh, you, you start, you start, and take projects on that you have no idea how to do, but you have the, a bit ambition to do it, right? Yeah. And you figure it out. I love doing that. It was great in the book when she said that. Someone asked that question, or was like, "Would you want the leader of a company to say, look, I really, I'm scared. I'm stuck. I don't know what I'm doing.' No one said yes, except." Uh, the angel investors, when asked that question, every single one of their hands shot up. It's yeah. like, yeah, you want you want to know if the CEO knows what he's yeah, doing. Yeah, you clear the room out. Yeah. Well, that's one of the first things that Berkshire Hathaway does when they when they buy a company. Uh, they buy the company for sixty percent of its book value. It's called optionality because they know even if it fails, they can they can fire sell and get their money back. So if they can't buy it for sixty percent of what it's worth, they won't buy it. Mm-hmm. And the first thing they do is they take the leader out and put a new leader in. And they always do that. Always. Yeah. So, I mean, you don't want to be, oh, Berkshire wow. Hathaway is looking at buying your company. You don't want to be up there being vulnerable. There are times for it. That's the point. There's times to be vulnerable and there's times to be strong. And I guess there's times to be in the middle. Like, she would say that they are one and the same. Oh. And I would debate that. Yeah. Come but, on the show, Brene. I don't know. I, I I don't know if she said there were one and the same. There were. I think she kind of said that there are times to be less vulnerable. Like if you if you're really lost, I mean, it's it's dangerous to tell people that are following you that are that are in jeopardy. I mean, if a company goes out of business because their you know, employees leave, it's a big problem. Right. Or be methodical yeah. about how you're being vulnerable. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Or giving pieces, yeah. little pieces at a time. Right. Right. I think um, you know the country went through this this thing with COVID nineteen and and the leaders. Um, you know, whatever you think of the leadership, I mean, we, we eased into some of these restrictions, right? We closed things down a little bit at a time. It didn't it just didn't just massive close down. They're being vulnerable. They're still being vulnerable about, you know, what, what reopening looks like. Like that's a, that's a very delicate example Yeah. of, you know, what to say and how much you give. And it's challenging because there's, there's just not precedent. Right. You know, uh, Chris Christie wrote an op-ed <clears throat> about vulnerability. He was basically like, um, I caught, you know, uh, some of it, but he was like, look, you guys need to be courageous here and take some risks with, and this is very, you know, uh, polarizing concept, but he's mm-hmm. like, there, we need our leaders to be courageous with this opening and it needs to start happening. You can't keep people in forever because you're scared of, you know, there's no easy solution here. Right. And your re-election is not the forefront driving this. Right? You got to look at the big picture. Um, yeah. And so that was interesting because the vulnerability was actually in the title of, I think, the post where I read it. Yeah. And vulner- what's about, what about vulnerability of trying to solve a problem we don't know the answer to? Yeah. I like, mean, like you have, I mean, you like them or don't like them. And I think the jury's out 50-50 on this is like when you offer a solution, potential solution to it, and you're not sure exactly what it is. There's going to be half of people that are going to terrorize you over it online, you mm-hmm. know, and 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 frame it in, a, in an unpopular way, and then there's a part of the people that want to hear that hope. They want to hear like, yeah, okay, it's cool. We don't know what's what are we working on. Tell right. us. But the very same statement would say, like, we don't know what we're work. We're not sure what we're going to be. What will work? That's a difficult conversation to have. That's an example of how much do you share. 
because there's a, a very high price to sharing too much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a very delicate uh, challenge a leader has. Being a public servant, being a leader, I mean, if in the example you just gave, it is vulnerability. It's like in the job description. Right. When you have, when, you know, when you're cutting your constituents down the middle and half of them like you, half of them don't, mm-hmm. you're vulnerable. Like you have to be vulnerable. Yeah. It, it, you can't hide. It's not, you know, there's other things you're going to be criticized, right? And when you take criticism to, to and you, you've been through this with some of your, you've written some of the most beautiful speeches and applied the most amazing video and music to it and words. And someone, somebody, what do they call it? Troll you. They, this they nasty, shut the F up in caps. Yes, nasty <laughs> asshole. And you're like, and then once you never say anything, which I, I don't know how you could possibly do that. So I, I, I pop in sometimes on your behalf, but you never want to take a criticism too close to your heart. Yeah, because that's when you'll stop being being true to your your values. You know, God, your vulnerability. Yeah, you know, your vulnerability. Like if your if your if your value is legacy and creativity, and you take that like that 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 criticism too close to your heart, it'll start to infect your creativity, which will affect your legacy. It's, it's so beautifully you gotta, put. Yeah, you got to bounce it off. Um, if, if you if you're defending yourself, you're taking it personal, which is the opposite of depersonalizing you know right. that's kind of how i'm looking at it because there yeah. are times when i'd love to because yeah, this is a leadership book i keep i keep forgetting like vulnerability is a is is something that you would yeah. share as a friend as a parent you know as a as a as a co-worker and as a certainly as a leader yeah. but when you're leading um you know you're going to get criticized for things yeah. if, you're, if you're not getting criticized for things you're not leading oh steve the aristotle quote which one to avoid criticism do nothing say nothing be nothing I don't remember that, that one. Um, I thought the reason I said that and looked at you weirdly <laughs> is because uh, I, I thought this. I was that's thinking, your, I was thinking your, it, yeah. a few weeks back we looked it up. Yeah, I was going to say, look it up. That's, what he, <laughs> that's why he said it. I love Aristotle quote. What do you got for questions, Steve? Um, I got take this some one right here. I got one that um, says, when have you felt most vulnerable? Mm. What's the context? Anything. In life? Yeah. Maybe in business. Oh, in business? Um, oh, in business was definitely when, when I first got announced as a CEO. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't actually, I... Uh, All spotlights on you. Well, I had just gotten divorced, so I also had, um, I, was, I was in weak financial position. Mm. I didn't want to let anybody know that, let alone the company that put me in that position. I wasn't weak, but I was severely compromised. My, my obligations had changed, and I was trying to implement something that I was experimenting with as I went. <laughs> So that's a big part of vulnerability, um, but I mean, that, that, I mean, that's definitely one one area that. Uh, how did I deal with it? I didn't have these tools at the time. I kind of faked it. Yeah, yeah. Masked it. Put on your armor. Yeah, I, I, I just endured, and I took I took on a lot of stress, uh, which showed up later in in the form of liver failure. Because when you stockpile stress, um, the body keeps count. Of yeah. That. And it never it never loses this calculation. And at the end, at some point, when you're stockpiling stress and you're dealing with stress, you're gonna you're gonna pay. The body's gonna give out and say, "Time to pay." And it usually shows up in anxiety, depression, or a healthcare issue. Mm. So if I was more vulnerable, I would have had an ability to ask for help. Like the company I, that worked for was a really small. It was a small, big company. They would have helped me if I if I would have said, "Hey." I'm not 100% sure what to tell these people. <laughs> Give right. me some clues because the guy that I was partners with was retiring. So it was a pretty safe transition. Oh, so he would have loved to have helped. He yeah. did. And yeah. he's to this day still my mentor. He still was there to help. But even though when, you're, when your name's on the door, that's what they say. When your name's on the door, the buck stops there. So right. you can get fired. You went from a world where you, if you're a salesperson, you can never get fired if you can sell. If you're a leader and you have salespeople working for you, the first thing that happens when sales goes down is you get fired. Mm. So you, you lose a lot of your, your um, you lose a lot of your um, job security and your identity. It's your identity becomes the collective identities of the many. Isn't that funny? So that would mean the culture there without knowing anything. I mean, it wasn't not that it rewarded shame, as she would say, but there wasn't the promotion of vulnerability. Oh, no <laughs> way. No, I mean, also right. it was a, th- 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 my first meeting there was a CEO that was a female. She was new. 
And she stood up, and there was only one other CEO in the room. There was 90 CEOs, mm -hmm. and there was two women. So there wasn't a lot of female, feminine energy mm -hmm. in the room. To my point, as I said earlier, in a healthy way, like someone should have said, like, this is a very you know, low level of empathy environment. And it was, you know, it was, it was productive, but it was also destructive. There was a lot of people that got, you know, what I say, whacked. <laughs> <laughs> people whose bodies everywhere. If you didn't perform, you got, you got whacked. There was no, no ability to be vulnerable and, and put corrective actions in place, mm. you know, to learn about people's real, real struggles. You can't, you can't fix something you don't know is wrong if someone's hiding it from you. And, no one, and worse, people can't fix what they don't know you think is wrong. Yeah. You're hiding it from them. It's just in a, you know in the very first part of the book it says be be clear is kind and don't be unclear because that's unkind. What about you? I um, take the hard question. You can have one. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I think of you know kind of like the the bullets along the way. Um, you know, if chronologically with my my TEDx talk, so um, you know. It, I say leaving my job, but I, it felt bigger and it was bigger because it wasn't just like saying, all right, I'm going to throw my resume around. It was literally a life trajectory that you stop and you look in the mirror and you go, nope. And you take an acoustic guitar and you just play it for a year and a half and you feel like a loser. I mean, that's vulnerable. You know, like I, yeah, I had to learn that it was okay to not be like, uh, to not know what you're doing and not be you know, set in your ways and have this corporate job and feel like the man. And it just took me a while to realize what I wanted. So that was definitely one. Um, my first speaking engagement <laughs> was one. So like the, <laughs> the way it, it worked was my, my YouTube <clears throat> grew way faster than my speaking component of what I do, like live speaking. Mm -hmm. So I had, you know, 60, 70,000 subscribers and I was getting calls to speak at venues that warranted that. And I'm holding a mic in my bedroom. <laughs> and so it's, it's like, okay. Um, and you're like the wizard of Oz, right? It's, it's like shot out of a cannon. Yeah. Do you so, know what the wizard of Oz is? I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 for yeah. sure. That, that these little guys behind the thing. And it's like this, this big giant companies ran out of this little speaker <laughs> on this little computer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that cool? The face at the end. Is We're talking about this today, you know, to, to about <laughs> how, how Brene, and this is, this kind of, I think it's kind of, kind of related is how she brought vulnerability and shame to corporate, like the, to the Navy SEALs, to the, mm -hmm. the Delta, to teachers, to doctors, to all industries, because it's, it's an applicable. And we were talking on the deck today when we were brainstorming about the book about how motivation, you know, that you broke away from, broke out of corporation to share your ideas about motivating and inspiring people. But what corporations need is that. Yeah. To connect the dots to go back and share that idea. It could be a good next chapter in your life. It feels like Star Wars. You leave, you go on this journey, <laughs> read a book a week for two years, come back and you know what I mean? That's, um, that's it. I mean, it is. No, that's, I mean, I'm in the same boat. I, I left financial services, had no intentions of ever returning, ever, no whatsoever. Is that, that, that toxicity of the grind? I was like, wow, I hate that industry. I, I, it was like, you never know where your next dollar is coming from. And every time I read a book, I turned a stone over as I became doing this podcast and learning and connecting with people through social media. There's like a whole new universe. I said, wow, every time I turned a stone over, it was usable in that industry. So I'm getting gigs in that industry now. And I'm enjoying it. I'm having a good time. And it feels like I'm teaching like a new language. Like a new lens yeah, on things. Yeah. Like I'm an interpreter from one world because that was a very low tech, low social media world. And we're in a pretty, in my mind, because we have great, you know, I'm with younger people that have high tech abilities, storytelling, technology, good audio, good video, mm. this place. You know, they, these are like the, the, the keys to the next chapter in people's lives. Amen. And just wait till the 16 to 35 millimeter lens comes in. <laughs> Here we go. I have another nugget. I have no idea what that means. But <laughs> Eddie, came, Eddie came running into the room the other day. He said, I got, you got a new lens. I said, what the hell's wrong with the lenses we use? It's like amazing video. <laughs> um, tell me what you guys think about this. This is just something I remembered that I want to make sure we say about the book. It was, if you don't have the tools to make sure you can get up when you fall, you won't take the risk that you can fall. One more time. If you don't have if you don't have the tools to get up, you won't have 
you won't take the risk to fall. So basically, if they don't, if you're not vulnerable with people, they're not willing to even fall because they don't even know if you're going to catch them if they fall. What's Last your chapter thought? of the book. My, she, she said, learning to rise is teaching. Remember how they teach the jump school? They teach you how to fall first. They don't teach you. Well, actually, they can't teach you after you fall. Like, that's your dead. Right. So in jump school, they teach you first how to, if, you're, if you do fall, you got to fall like this to avoid breaking your legs. And they teach you that before you jump. I like, I mean, of course. I love the metaphor. Yeah. I mean, the, I, if I was to poke a hole in it at all, it would be some. I mean, it's almost like not a plane, but sometimes you need to fall in right. to learn how to get, like you, you equip yourself as you're falling right. and then you get back up and you learn, you learn, you learn. You know, that's why I'm such an advocate for like putting, do you get what I'm saying? There's, two, there is, there's these off, well, these cliches, you know, leap and the net will appear. And then there's another one that says, don't do it. You know, that always know where your next. Well, I actually right. talk about this all the time. Like mentally, you have to be willing to uh, compartmentalize and be like, okay, I leaped. This is my life now. I'm moving towards this period. But, you know, the Stockdale paradox, mm -hmm. you know, you got to have that goal of what you're going to be. No, you're going to be there, but you have to be pragmatic in the approach. You can't be an idiot. Right. Like if I'm like, I'm going to have, um, you know, I want to own the Marlins. I can't just sit here and, and, and talk about how I'm going to own the Marlins, right? right? You got to be totally pragmatic, realize that I'm billion short <laughs> and start moving towards that. That's, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's yeah, my yeah. point. The intersection of faith that'll happen and the, and the, the, bru the courage to confront the brutal reality of the facts. Right. And right. then put a plan in place to make those intersect. Yeah. That's very cool. Oh yeah. And she actually talked about that in there, didn't she? Jim Collins, man. He, books, he comes books, up everywhere. If you want to write a book someday, just read a bunch of books and collect two or three ideas or three or four. Three or four. From that, right? <laughs> you get three or four ideas, it comes up. <laughs> uh, it's true, though. I mean, these stories are all shared book to book to book to book to book. You start, it, you start to see them come up again and again, um, which is cool. It's a good thing. Wait, you got another question, Steve? Well, that kind of leads me into my next one, which was... one more. How do you get better at handling failure? It's kind of the similar. I have another question if you want to pick which one. So pick between these two questions. Hmm. How do you let in what's constructive and not let in criticism that keeps you from trying to be brave? Well, I guess you, what, which one? You, what was the first one? The first one was how do you get better at handling failure? So are we picking one of the two? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't, like, I don't like either of them. All right. <laughs> pick a uh, quote. Uh, uh, you take one. I'll, I'll, take the, I'll take the one you don't take. So it gives me a second to think. Sure. How do you let in what's constructive and not let in criticism that keeps you from trying to be brave? Okay, so you realize, like, the people that criticize you, I forget who I heard say this, like, no one on your level or higher is going to criticize you. It's, it, it's just the way it works, right? It's a defense mechanism for a lot of people is to criticize, to criticize, to criticize. Number two, it's life, right? right? It is vulnerability, and so if you don't want to be criticized, that's totally cool. You don't have to ever be criticized. You can stay in your living room until you die. Yeah, you'll never get criticized. You know, it's literally the, the process, put the quarter in to get the gumball out. The criticism is the quarter. The vulnerability is the quarter. Yeah, that's take your medicine when you need to. The, um, the, key to. the key to that is if someone's giving you a series of criticisms, and typically they come in clumps, uh, there's always one or two ideas in there that you can take. You can leave the rest it's like an apple. Take a bite. So you're talking about constructive feedback, not just like noise. I, I mean, I think they're closely related. Um, I mean, criticism, just, just angry, destructive. So, for example, I could go on, on this is my life, right? Uh, so, in this example, I could go on a video of mine that has a million views, <clears throat> a lot of people saying that this video really changed the way they think, and then there'll be someone that says, like, this is the worst thing I've ever heard, like, shut up. And so oh, yeah. our, the way our brain is wired is we won't see anything but the one person. And so you have to realize that that now, again, if we're talking like collecting data, like the feedback that the world is giving, if you're constantly doing something, creating something, trying to add value and it's not sticking, then that's being pragmatic and that's feedback. That's a little different. You yeah. Know? I um, think there's lessons in both. I mean, you don't know when someone's, if something's that, off it's probably by the way it's probably a competitor just giving you a hard time could be yeah um because it's unreasonable you can always just chalk it up to that that that's not a reasonable thing that someone would say about your work um but there's 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 times when there's you know criticism shows up in feedback too because we used to do role playing we'd have you know you would do role playing that's one way to 
to fail first, you know, to speak to that question earlier is like role playing is, you know, a simulation. Mm. That's why flight at flight, you know, people are jumping a simulator because, you know, what happens in a simulator, the, 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 the flight simulator introduces all kinds of dynamic, you know, wind shear, uh, equipment failure, all kinds of things, pilot error, and then all at once. Same is true with role playing, but when we role play, there'd be sometimes five or six people that sit there watching and giving you criticism, and I could see people's faces just turn like bright red. Yeah, you know they're they're taking it too too much to heart when the reality is everyone in the room says no, just say it differently and you'll make money and this will be over. Do it, you know, you got to eat eat your um, take your medicine, you know, once and and then you have it forever. That's I think that's a big part of it. Nice. How would you answer it? Um, handling failure or the constructive? Well, I like what you said about the constructive criticism is that uh, people that are only below you saying criticism. But I think uh, like Brene says, she kind of says, think of what how you feel from it. And if, you, if you're causing it, if the situations try to be objective with the situation, are you feeling that it's criticism because it's making you feel negative and it's outraging you? Maybe it's hitting that button that's making you chandelier mm -hmm. to go with all these terms we've been using. And then just yeah. be objective with those emotions of can I use this constructively? And when it comes to handling failure, I say um, just kind of be ready for it, but uh, always try to look for the positive. And e like, even with this quarantine, when there's nothing to do, uh, you can strengthen that positivity muscle because when you, the way you see the world is different when you try to see it through that lens. So if you're handling failure, if you always look at a failure as like, uh, like the principles, the looping upwards, mm -hmm. it's like, it's always, it's like a stepping stone. Then it's really helpful to even find the, constructive step in that so that's how it helped fail you but i have a very special surprise that i just realized for this episode oh, nice. this is how we're going to end it first let's talk about the next book and i'll end with the surprise What's oh the next my book? god the next book is the 12 week year by brian moran i just talked to him today he wrote it's a it's a book about periodization it's how to take the year and you break it into 12 weeks uh, a 12 week year so there's four 12 week years so it's a way that you can get four times the production, the productivity out of your life by applying. He has a wonderful framework. I use this, uh, the 12 week year in my business and doubled my company using these principles. And I called Brian a couple days ago and he agreed to come on the show Ooh. and do a, and he also agreed to do a private interview, but we're going to review the book. I don't even call it a review. We're going to wrap on the book. Um, I can't, I don't like the word review, but Brian, um, this is a, a process that he adopted from Olympic athletes because Olympic athletes um, train in this periodization, these 12 week years. So he, he brought that to business. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm two, yeah. two chapters in, I think. And, and all, right away, it's like exactly what I need. Because, uh, go on. It's a framework to execute ideas. So when we do 12 week year, and Brian interacts with us on the 12 week year. It's a framework to process new ideas forever. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a, a new idea that comes and goes. It's a, it's a, it's a methodology to implement ideas and curate ideas. It's pretty, it's, it's a very timely book. I'm very excited about it. Yeah, it'd be awesome. All right. So to wrap up this episode, uh, I read the book last year called living in flow. It's about synchronicities. We might have the author on too. just, just throwing that out there. Synchronicities are meaningful coincidences. And we have a synchronicity on this episode. We introduced three or four <laughs> for our listeners and it's actually season three, episode four right now. Wow. <laughs> so I just had to bring that out and we'll end it with this. <laughs> and that's it. Perfect. All right, man. See you later.